chapter 20 is covering the metabolism, nutrition, and body temperature concept. Um, once the nutrients are observed, I, are um, absorbed from the digestive tract, they go through um, a full range of chemical transformations, uh, and they are um, they become a smaller particles that the body can absorb and use. Um, all those um, transformations um, that will uh, involve either usage of those nutrients or storage of the nutrients um, are described as the body's metabolism. And when we look at the metabolism, we have two um, major types of metabolic activities. We have the catabolism, uh, that is the breakdown um, of complex compounds into uh, more uh, simpler com uh, components. And uh, we'll include in the catabolism, we include the digestion of the food um, that transforms the nutrients into smaller molecules. Um, and those smaller molecules will release the energy uh, to the cells. And we have the second type of metabolic activity, which is the, um, the counterpart of the catabolism, which is the anabolism, that is the building up of um, big storage compounds out of simple substances. Um, also in anabolism, we have the building of structural components for the uh, tissue and cell repair or uh, growth uh, as structural materials, and also some um, development of some functional molecules as enzymes and transporters. This is an overview of our lecture for today. Uh, we'll start by describing the different types of uh, metabolic activities, the catabolism uh, with all its uh, components, the anabolic processes, and we'll define and talk about the metabolic rate. Um, we'll look into the nutritional guidelines um, as they are detailed per type of nutrient. We'll uh, describe several disorders that involve the metabolic uh, activity of the body. We'll look at nutrition and its implications uh, as it pertains for uh, different groups of age and aging especially. And we'll look into uh, the body temperature, which is uh, related to the metabolic activity in terms of heat loss, heat gain, regulation, um, mechanism of developing fever and roles of fever in our body, heat associated disorders, and cold associated disorders. Please take a moment and um, stop this presentation in order for you to review the learning objectives for this lecture. So when we are talking about um, types of metabolic activities, um, let's review. We have the uh, catabolism, um, that is the breaking down of those complex uh, structured uh, components into simple um, uh, uh, particles that are um, easy to use by the body, and we have the anabolism, just the reverse process. Now, we define um, a reaction uh, that will transfer some of the potential energy that is stored in the nutrients into the bonds, into ATP molecules that um, are, if you remember, we were calling the ATP as the cell batteries. Those uh, are the molecules that are storing energy that when needed, the cells can uh, use for their activities. And this catabolic process is called uh, cellular respiration. Um, part of the energy that uh, is also released in the cellular respiration while we are uh, creating the ATP molecules will be also um, transformed into heat. If you remember, I was telling you from the basic law of physics that the energy um, doesn't disappear, just transforms, becomes a different form of energy. Uh, so part will become heat, part will become kinetic energy, and all those, in fact, are used in order to support the body's uh, activities, including maintaining the body temperature. Um, they all start with very basic components. And if you remember, the basic nutrients that our body can use are glucose for the carbohydrates, fatty acids for the fats, and very rarely, whenever we do not have any leftover storage of glucose or fatty acids, um, or the body cannot use it efficiently in some condition, in some disorders, uh, the body can use the amino acids. On the, um, the opposite 
side of the process, we have the anabolism that is taking the same um, uh, uh, basic components and is building them into more complex, it's, uh, complex compounds that will be uh, stored in uh, the warehouses of our body where we have the storage um, areas in our body. In addition to that, those basic components will be used to uh, create and um, build up other cells, uh, repair tissues, um, or growing um, the entire uh, organism, and also will be used for um, creating enzymes and transport, as those are special types of proteins. And we will look into each of the um, uh, catabolic um, uh, mechanisms for each of the uh, components that I just um, mentioned. Let's look at the glucose. So, when we are looking at the cellular respiration of the glucose or the metabolism of the glucose, the first step of it, and look at the image on your uh, right side of your screen, uh, the blue area, you see that the first step of breaking down the glucose, and the glucose has six atoms of carbon, um, the first step will not require oxygen. And because of that, because it doesn't require oxygen, it's called an anaerobic uh, phase. Um, the process of breaking down the glucose, it's called glycolysis. And the place where it, uh, the uh, location of this process will be in the uh, cytoplasm um, of the cells. And as a result of breaking down the glucose, um, in terms of energy, will produce two molecules of ATP, which are produced without the help of oxygen. If we burn out the glucose without oxygen in an anaerobic cycle, we end up having two molecules only of ATP. And as a result of that, we'll have two molecules that are called pyruvate. And pyruvate has only three um, atoms of carbon, each of them. Because go, if we go back again, nothing is lost. I start with six atoms of carbon. I end up with six altogether, however, in two components. Now, the pyruvate can transform itself in a reversible type of um, uh, reaction. Uh, you see the arrows going both ways into an acid. They are both acids. Um, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in another type of acid that is called a, a lactate, also having three carbons. And now this one, the lactate, is a very useful energy intermediate product. Um, and if you are going to the gym and you're exercising and you're doing any type of cardio, uh, at a certain point, especially if you were not um, highly trained before, you will start to feel your muscles sore at a certain point. And this soreness is a result of accumulation of lactate because your muscle will function uh, in a deficit of oxygen. Your body is not used with that extreme type of effort and your body will um, get into a debt of oxygen. Energy will still be provided to your muscles. However, that is done in an anaerobic type of environment. And as a result of that, there will be an accumulation of um of lactate in the muscle. Um, now, the lactate, it's, it's a weak acid, and um, it will cause this type of soreness. And originally, uh, we thought that the lactate is damaging to the muscle. However, uh, it's not as much damage as we thought. Uh, one point why uh, pyruvate will become lactate is become it cannot be metabolized without oxygen more than that. It will stay as pyruvate if I don't have oxygen. Now we are moving into the second stage of it. And the second stage of the cellular respiration or the metabolism of glucose at the level of the cell will be the processing of glucose in an environment that has oxygen. And this will take place now, instead of being in the cytoplasm, it will take place in the mitochondria. So inside the mitochondria, the cells are able to use oxygen to burn glucose. However, the mitochondria will not want to grab the glucose, will do this in an aerobic environment, and it will grab, in fact, the pyruvate. Um, so the pyruvate inside the, um, from, from one molecule of glucose, uh, once grabbed inside the, um, the mitochondria, 
and exposed to oxygen and burned in the presence of oxygen will release this time 30 molecules of ATP, which is a huge amount of energy. So you see that the burning inside the mitochondria is way more efficient. And as a result of that, we'll have a, um, as products of um, decomposition, we'll have three molecules of carbon dioxide and three molecules of water. So when we are looking and we are calculating, we are counting down the atoms that are coming in from glucose and those that are coming out from it, you see that you have just the same amount of uh, atoms. What we have added in the second cycle is the oxygen. And what we have as a result, we have a huge amount of energy in and in addition, the bypro the waste products are those that the body can easily dispose and um, actually use because the body will continue to use this water up to a point when some of the water is definitely eliminated. Um, however, this water is still utilized by the body. What will eliminate this waste product from the cellular respiration will be the CO2. If we look and put together both of those stages, you can see that from one molecule of glucose, starting with an anaerobic stage and moving into an aerobic stage, we have altogether 32 atoms, uh, molecules, I'm sorry, of ATP for each molecule of glucose. However, if in the anaerobic process, that's a pretty straightforward one and easy to uh, perform in the mitochondria, there are some enzymes that are necessary for the what is called the process of oxidation. Um, and those are done in the presence of uh, enzymes and there will be for different tissues, I may need some, I may need some uh, special catalysts that will be vitamins and minerals. Now let's look what happens with the cellular respiration when we are um, using as a source of energy, fatty acids or um, amino acids. Well, um, as opposed to the amino acids, the proteins, uh, the uh, byproducts of proteins, not byproducts, but the um, uh, components of the proteins, the fatty acids are used um, more often in order to generate energy. They are what is called oxidized. Um, if you remember, the oxidation is the process of burning a substance in the presence of oxygen. Um, and for the fatty acid, this, um, this happens also um, inside the mitochondria in order to generate uh, ATP. Now, um, the fatty acids, as opposed to glucose, that can start as, um, uh, as an anaerobic process. Uh, the fatty acids have to have oxygen. Uh, they can be burned only in the presence of oxygen and not without it. They will be completely break down, uh, broken down to um, result to produce ATP and as a, a waste product of the uh, burning process, we'll, we'll have carbon dioxide um, and water. It's a little bit different for proteins and you'll understand why the process of burning proteins is a little bit more difficult for our body. So the amino acids one of the uh, most important components of the amino acids is the um, amine group or the nitrogen that is present in the amino acids. So in order for the amino acids to be able to be used as, a f as fuel, as energy, they will need to have this um, uh, nitrogen removed. And the process of removing the nitrogen is called deamination. And the deamination occurs at the level of the liver. Uh, the nitrogen that results from the um, uh, breaking up um, those nitrogen groups will be transferred by the liver and will form um, a compound, a, a molecule that is called urea. And we produce urea by combining nitrogen with carbon dioxide. Urea will be eliminated as a waste product, will be eliminated in the uh, bloodstream and will be transported to the kidneys in order to be um, eliminated. So just by knowing that, you understand that those people that have a diet that is very high in proteins, they will uh, break down proteins. They will metabolize somehow the proteins as well. Um, and as a result of that, 
uh, we can differentiate someone that has a high protein diet from someone that has a low protein diet just by looking at the amount of urea that they will eliminate uh, in their urine. We will describe now what is called the metabolic rate. And um, metabolic rate will define the intensity, the rate at which a cellular respiration will metabolize nutrients in order to produce energy and in order to produce ATP. You remember that the body makes this ATP on demand. So the metabolic rate is actually related to the overall energy requirement. If we say that, we understand that the metabolic rate will be dependent on a few factors as the person size, the uh, body fat, the gender, the age, the level of activity, and also will be under the influence of some hormones and especially the thyroid hormones, the thyroxine, that can increase the metabolic rate um, and, and speed it if it's on high levels or it can lower if it's on low levels. Um, it's also obvious that the metabolic rate is very high in children, that they are growing and they are building up uh, tissues. Uh, it's also increased in adolescents and will definitely, it makes sense to be like that, will decrease with age. In order to be able to um, have a common language and um, use the same type of, um, um, of notions, we are defining the basal metabolism. And the basal metabolism is that amount of energy that is needed to maintain um, basic life functions when once my body is at rest. We call it basal metabolic rate, BMR. And this is the energy that um, my body will expend each day simply to stay alive not to perform any kind of extreme activities. Um, and this means um, any activity that I perform, even moving my hand a little bit, will increase the energy expenditure above the BMR. In other, in other words, the BMR is, or the basal metabolic rate is uh, the energy that I'm spending while I'm sleeping. The unit that we are using to measure the energy is called the kilocalorie. Um, and you can see it um, most of the time, um, even on the, uh, uh, the packages of different uh, food products as KCAL, kilocalorie. And a kilocalorie um, is defined um, as the amount of heat needed to raise one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. And this is how it's measured. So the nutritional information is um, sometimes replacing the word kilocalories by just calories to be less confusing. However, we are still talking about those kilocalories and the same amount of, uh, in terms of definition of amount of energy is the same uh, thing. Well, we'll discuss now the um, um, nutritional needs that an individual may have. And there are certain guidelines regarding the nutritional um, um, amounts of different types of nutrients that we need to have in our daily diet. And those um, needs may vary uh, based on the individual, um, based on the age, the size, uh, based on their health uh, status. However, um, as a general rule, the typical recommendation for the number of calories uh, that uh, are derived from each type of ingredient um, those need to be um, classified and, and uh, we'll continue discussing the nutrient metabolism by addressing now um, the processing of fats in our body. So most, our, most um, of our tissues will be able to use fatty acids for energy um, needs. Uh, some organs like um, is the liver will rely exclusively on fatty acids, while other tissues like uh, the muscle will use fatty acids during rest or very low intensity exercise. There is one exception, and that is the brain tissue that is not able to use any other source of energy but glucose uh, in order to provide um, energy. So 
uh, the brain will rely on glucose. However, it is able, the brain is able to partially, uh, to use partially uh, catabolized fatty acids, and those are called ketone bodies. Uh, usually large amounts of ketone bodies will be produced um, in the liver in states of starvation or prolonged fasting or whenever the um, intake of carbohydrates is very low. Um, and this and the ketones will be able to provide energy for brain and then some other tissues if, if needed. Um, there is another situation where the um, liver will be tricked into thinking that there is no glucose available. Um, and this is the uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. In, in diabetes, what happens is that there are high levels of glucose in the bloodstream. However, the cells uh, will not going to be able to utilize it because of the inefficient or inexistent production of insulin that is the facilitator for the uh, glucose usage. Um, in other words, the fatty acids have um, uh, this um, uh, ability of um, concentrating um, high uh, amounts of energy. And by burning fats, the body is able to produce more ATP molecules than um, will be produced by burning glucose. When we are burning a gram of fat, um, that will yield about nine kilocalories of energy per each gram, while the proteins or the uh, glucose uh, will produce only four kilocalories per gram. Um, this being said, you understand now why the body will prefer to store energy or extra calories on any type of excess calories in the form of fat, because it's so efficient when it will be needed um, and be released from the, uh, from the storage places. Uh, so the excess of calorie intake, that can be any type of excess uh, calorie intake, it can be carbohydrates or proteins or fat, will be all however, transformed and converted into triglycerides and will be stored in the adipose tissue. The adipose tissue, whenever there is a need for energy or will have a time of uh, deficiency in nutrients, will be, uh, the glycerides will be broken out from the fatty tissue and uh, re released back into the bloodstream. Now, looking at the proteins, proteins do not represent a specialized storage form. Um, and this is because proteins are synthesized by the body in very specific situations, and they will uh, be produced in order to meet specific body needs. Um, they are produced to heal tissues or to produce, um, to uh, contribute into the growth and development of the body. Um, let's say when someone is uh, training uh, in the gym and is trying to build up muscle by exposing the muscle to a continuous and sustained effort, the muscle is forced to produce and synthesize more, more uh, um, myosin and uh, actin and myosin, uh, the, uh, the micro uh, fibrils that will, uh, in, um, in consequence, will increase the size of the muscle. Because if you remember, the muscle is not growing because of an increased number of muscle cells, but by an increased size of each cell. Uh, in other words, um, the protein is not the preferred source of energy for our body. The fats and the carbohydrates are described as a protein sparing source of energy because they will be used uh, first before the proteins in order for the body to keep maintaining its structure. Which of the following is not an example of catabolism? A. Glycolysis. B. Deamination. C cellular respiration, or D, glycogen formation. The glycogen formation is not an example of catabolism, it is in fact an example of anabolism. Our daily nutritional needs may vary, um, and they can vary by individual and by state of anabolism or catabolism that we are uh, into for that specific uh, period of time. However, there are some typical recommendations for the number of calories that will come from each of the um, main three types of nutrients. Based on those nutritional guidelines, we see and we define as a balanced diet, a diet that will have um, as a source of energy, 55 to 60 percent of it will be based on carbohydrates, 30 percent or, or less will be based on fat, and in addition, will have 15% up to 
um, made up of protein. You probably figure it by now, figure it out by now that a healthy diet will need to have um, quite an, an abundant um, amount of carbohydrates. However, when we are looking into the diet, we want to have what is called the complex, those that are made out of many molecules and not the simple sugars, not those that are called the monosaccharides. That if you remember them, those were the glucose and fructose and the galactose. Um, you know your table sugar um, by um, their, the chemical name is sucrose and is uh, a disaccharide, while the sugar in the milk is also a, a molecule made out of two um, um, saccharides that is called um, lactose. So the body will, um, the moment that the simple sugars are present in our bloodstream, they um, the blood glucose level will increase, and as a result of um, being um, captured and used by the cells very quick, that will be done in, um, in association with a boost on increasing the insulin output. And as a result of that combination of a high insulin level with a high glucose level, the glucose will quickly drop. Now, we don't like those kind of ups and downs in our body. We want our uh, glucose level to be kind of steady. And that can be, um, and it should be kept in a, in a range that is normally 85 to 125 milligrams uh, per deciliter throughout the entire day. Now, how can we do that? Um, there is a, a term that is called um, glycemic effect. And the glycemic effect will measure how quickly a certain um, food will raise the blood glucose level, and as a result of that, will stimulate the release of insulin. So let's take the example of, um, of sugar, of pure sugar. Uh, when you're eating a spoon of sugar or you're drinking a sugary drink, uh, one of the um, uh, carbonated uh, drinks, this is a simple sugar. It will raise the glucose very, very high. As a result of that, the the insulin will spike to keep it down. And as, as a result of the whole phenomenon, instead of having a steady level of glucose, you will have this increase with decrease that happens very quick in our body. On the other hand, if we are eating something that has complex carbohydrates, like the grains or the fruits, vegetables, uh, some of the dairy products, those will have the branch out the complex types of sugars that the body will need to break down in tiny pieces and release uh, um, throughout the time and not at once at a high level uh, those tiny molecules of glucose. And by doing that and metabolizing it slowly, I mean, like it does, it seems slowly to, to the process of eliminating it, transmitting it to the bloodstream, but it's at the body's meta metabolic rate. Um, it will ensure that the level of glucose will stay a constant throughout the day. In addition to that, um, most of the um, um, grains and the vegetable will have also um, fibers um, that are like cellulose, uh, pectin, and gums, and those are not used as the source of energy. However, they do add as a bulk to the stool and will promote the elimination of toxin and waste through from our uh, digestive system. In addition, they will slow the digestion and absorption of those complex carbohydrates. And by doing that, we'll keep the glucose constant instead of having it spiking quick up and down. We'll look now into the um, the nutritional guidelines as they pertain to the fats. Um, we said that we need 30% or less fats in our diet and, and fats in this type of moderate amounts are healthy and necessary and they will provide energy and they will be part, because they are part of some cell components, um, they will be used for uh, remodeling and restructuring and repairing the body. In addition, um, fats are tasty and they are adding that component of taste to some critical nutrient. Now, we need to understand that fats come in different types, in more than one kind. 
We have what is called essential. We have three types of fatty acids, and we'll start by describing the essential fatty acids first. Um, so most fatty acids can be synthesized by the body cells. However, there are two essential fatty acids that are called linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. And those need to come from the outside. They are called essential because our body cannot perform, cannot function in a good way, in, a, in an optimal way without the presence of those fatty acids. Uh, linoleic acid is obtained um, whenever we have plenty of vegetables, uh, and especially uh, those vegetables that have vegetable oils in them. Um, and linoleic acid is used um, by the body to produce prostaglandins. Uh, on the other hand, the alpha linoleic acid, uh, we get it from uh, fatty fish and shellfish. Uh, it's also found in dark green or leafy vegetables and in some types of uh, nuts as walnuts um, and in soybeans. We have another type of fat that is the saturated fat, and you can see how it looks like. Um, it's called saturated because uh, when um, you are looking at the structure, just pay attention to A and B and compare and contrast them. And you can see how in the kind of in the middle of your image, instead of having one line, one um, uh, bond between the carbon um, uh, molecules, you have a double uh, bond. So the, fasces, uh, the fatty acids uh, that are saturated have uh, in their structure more hydrogen atoms than they have than those that are called unsaturated. Uh, most saturated fats are coming from animal sources, um, and in terms of their physical properties, they look solid at room temperature. Uh, and as an example, you have the uh, butter and the lard. Um, in the same category, there are some tropical oils like coconut oil and palm oil. Um, so despite the fact that coconut and palm oil are considered uh, healthier types of fats, uh, they are in reality as a chemical structure, they are saturated fats. The unsaturated fats are uh, derived from plants. They, in terms of physical property, how do we differentiate them just by looking at them? You can see that they are liquid at room temperature, and we usually call them oils. We have corn and peanut and oil and canola. Um, and in those, you see that in the middle of the structure, they have less hydrogen atoms, and the carbons have a double uh, connection between each other. So um, when we are looking at our needs um, in a daily um, um, diet, you see that saturated fat should make up less than one third of the fat in the diet. It was proven by now that those people that have a diet high in saturated fat have higher risk um, to develop cancers, um, definitely heart disease and cardiovascular um, issues. Um, now, most unsaturated fats are liquid. And the problem with that is that they easily become spoiled or rancid. Um, and that's why most of the uh, manufacturers, in order to try and increase their shelf life, they will uh, saturate them artificially. It's, it's a process that happens in, in a company um, in, in terms of uh, um, when they are processing the oils. And the process is called uh, hydrogenation of the oils. And as a result of that, you have peanut butter, and you have the vegetable shortening and some of the margarines. And this is because by adding artificially um, in, uh, on a, a product line, the hydrogen inside the unsaturated fatty acids, those liquid type of oils become solid at room temperature and they start behaving as saturated fat. Amino acids are essential in order to synthesize proteins. In our body, we have um, about 20 amino acids that by different combinations, they will build up all the proteins um, that we have and um, will constitute the structure of our organism. Uh, 
Out of those 20 amino acids, 11 are called non-essential because our body doesn't need to take them out of food. Our body is able to synthesize those amino acids inside our body from other sources, let's say from fat or from glucose. Now, if I said that I have non-essential amino acids, you understand by now that we have what is called essential amino acids that our body has to receive them from the outside, um, as, um, from the diet. And there is one issue with that. It's the fact that the proteins, unlike the carbohydrates and the fats, will not going to be stored in special reserves. So those essential amino acids need to be provided or in a better way said, consumed regularly in order to have them available at any given moment during our existence. Now, most animal proteins will supply all those essential amino acids. Um, and that's why the animal proteins uh, are described as, as what is called complete protein. There is another thing that I would like to make you aware of. Even those non-essential amino acids in some extreme conditions as during extreme physical stress or in certain hereditary diseases, they may become an essential amino acid when the body has, is incapacitated to synthesize them. There are uh, proteins in plants also. However, um, the plant proteins will lack one or more of those essential amino acids. And by saying that, you can understand now why people on strict vegetarian diets, they need to learn how to combine foods, such as legumes, um, as beans or peas with grains like rice or wheat, in order to have all the essential amino acids for that they uh, supplied during the diet. Now, while the legumes, let's say, are rich in uh, isoleucine uh, and lysine, um, they will be poor in methionine and tryptophan. And you can see here in this uh, uh, chart how we need to combine legumes and grains in order to have um, a supply to the body all the nu nutrients that are necessary. Besides the three key uh, components in our diet, the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, there are uh, two other elements that are necessary um, and essential for a healthy metabolism, and those will be the minerals and the vitamins. So the minerals are those chemical elements um, that are uh, required sometimes for the body structure. They play um, a key role in fluid balance. Uh, and they uh, are required also in activities as muscle contraction or nerve impulse conduction uh, and in blood clotting. Some uh, minerals um, are components of vitamins, um, and also some of them are in very, very small amounts, however essential for a good metabolism, and then they are called uh, trace elements. And I'll give you a few examples. You heard a lot about uh, sodium and Sodium is essential for um, fluid balance, for nerve impulse conduction, and muscle contraction. And it's found in most of the foods. Um, it will be found in even high quantities in any type of processed food because it has this table salt uh, addition. Whenever there is a deficiency in sodium, the patient will manifest with weakness, cramps, diarrhea, or dehydration. The counter partner of sodium that you've heard a lot about it is the potassium, also essential for nerve and muscle activity, just like as sodium is in fluid balance. And we found uh, the potassium a lot in fruits, meats, uh, seafood, milk, um, and vegetables. Whenever there is a deficiency, uh, the patient will present with muscular or uh, neurologic disorders. Um, the next one that you've heard a lot about it also is calcium. Uh, main functions will be, as you remember, formation of bones and bones and teeth uh, has a key role in starting the blood clotting process is essentially nerve conduction and in mus muscle contraction also. We found calcium in high quantities in dairy products, eggs, green vegetable and legumes. And uh, whenever there is a deficiency in calcium, the patient will present with tetany 
uh, or osteoporosis, depending what type of deficiency is. And in children, we can see the rickets. You heard also about uh, another example that I can give is the iron, uh, which is a part of the uh, hemoglobin um, in the blood and the myoglobin at the level of the muscles. Um, there is a lot of uh, iron in meat and eggs. And nowadays, we have what is called fortified uh, cereals um, that are supplemented by iron in legumes in some dried food, fruit. Uh, deficiency in iron will manifest itself by anemia, uh, dry skin, and in some cases, uh, indigestion. Um, there are other microelements. There is a table in your book that you can um, look over and, and see uh, more of those because there are others that are also essential will be magnesium and um, copper and phosphorus uh, and fluoride. I was telling you that the next component that is essential besides carbohydrates, fats, and proteins will be the vitamins. And those are complex organic substances. Um, usually the body needs them in small quantities and they are part, they are participating in enzymatic processes um, and will uh, influence metabolic uh, processes by being part of enzymes. Um, whenever there is a deficiency in vitamins, uh, those may lead to a variety of nutritional conditions. Um, in terms of types of um, um, vitamins, we have those that are called water soluble, and those will be the B vitamin group and the vitamin C. Um, those type of vitamins are not stored and um, we actually need to receive them regularly uh, with our diet. We also have, if I said water soluble, obviously there are some that are fat soluble and those will be the vitamins A, D, E, and K. Um, those can be stored in small quantities in the fatty tissue. Um, and the excess intake of fat um, soluble vitamins because of that can lead to toxicity. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, the vitamin A or retinol is required for um, a healthy skin and for maintaining the health of the, um, of the eye pigment. It's also involved in reproduction and immunity. And the good sources for that will be uh, all the orange fruits and vegetables um, will be in high quantities in liver, eggs, and dairy products, as well as in dark green vegetables. As a deficiency of vitamin A, the patient will exhibit night blindness, uh, decreased immunity, and the dry, uh, scaly skin. Um, I will choose another one to give you uh, an example of folate or the folic acid is one of the vitamin B. There is a, a whole bunch of those, and you can review them in your book, please. Um, folate is uh, essential in the amino acid metabolism for the D DNA synthesis of the cells and the maturation of, of the red blood cells. It's found in vegetables, in liver, uh, legumes, and seeds. And whenever it's um, absent uh, or deficient, um, the patient will exhibit anemia, digestive disorders. And uh, for a pregnant uh, woman with a deficiency of folate or folic acid, the embryo will have what is called the neural tube defects, a profound malformation of the nervous system. Now, there are other substances that are uh, having a great value, uh, and they are called uh, antioxidants. And this is because um, they will protect the body against the, uh, what is called reactive oxygen species, or the free radicals. Um, those are unstable molecules that are produced uh, from oxygen in the normal course of the metabolism. Um, and in addition, they will be produced while um, people are smoking, uh, when there is a lot of air pollution, or when we are exposed to UV light. Those free radicals, probably you've heard about that by now, they are contributing to our aging and to the process of developing uh, diseases. The antioxidants are reacting with the free radicals, uh, and by doing that, they are stabilizing them, and they are inhibiting their harmful effects on, uh, on cells. Um, the, uh, some types of antioxidants will be the vitamin C and E um, and also the beta carotene. The question now would be, what is the real need for vitamin and minerals and do we need to supplement that? So 
there are some benefits of adding minerals and vitamin supplements to the diet of, um, of individuals. Um, however, this is a subject that was controversial and depending on uh, the source can be seen in, in different ways. Some of the researchers say that um, the necessary amount for the healthy, uh, to maintaining a healthy metabolism um, is just enough by having a, a healthy diet. Uh, and nowadays, many of the commercial foods as uh, even the basic ones like milk or cereal or bread are fortified with what is called minerals and vitamins. And if you Next time that you're buying one of those products, just look at the labels if you never did it before um, and see um, what do they contain and you'll see how they are enriched with um, those um, minerals and vitamins. Uh, on the other hand, there are other researchers that say that um, because um, we are exposed to pollution um, and uh, because our foods are now processed and refined and stored for long times, um, we need this additional supplementation in order to maintain a healthy organism. Um, well, there is no um, actual study that can show uh, with good numbers um, any uh, type of increased longevity based on usage of multi multivitamins. Um, there is no study that will show an improved brain function or uh, prevention of cancer. Um, on the other hand, if we are really looking into that, the an individual that has a chronic illness will have associated to that uh, some types of um, vitamin def deficiencies. And for this specific type of population, there is a benefit for supplements. We are not talking now about the general population. And as an example of a specific, a special type of population that will benefit from supplements will be the pregnant women um, by having their diet supplemented with iron and folic acid in order to uh, support the normal and good development of the fetus. A little bit over 100 years ago, in 1916, um, the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, published their first dietary guidelines that were presenting the general population um, a plan of what healthy eating patterns uh, mean. Um, those guidelines um, are currently revised every five years. Um, last time that they were revised was 2015, um, with those guidelines uh, being applied until this year, until 2020, um, they will need to be revised during this year. And you can see in this graph how, um, what are the um, recommendations of a healthy eating uh, diet will be. You see that we need to include uh, fruits and vegetables and proteins and dairy products and grains and uh, also um, oils. In terms of foods that are high in proteins, they are recommending meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs. Um, they also um, mentioned that proteins can be found in plants, um, such as in legumes and grains and some seeds and nuts. Um, the recommendation for grains will be to use the whole one, an unrefined one, because of the high quantity of fibers that they will still maintain. Um, they are also um, recommending to limit the amount of saturated and trans fats, that they are very similar to the saturated fats, uh, to limit the amount of added sugar and salt, and um, if possible, the fats and sugar to be less than 10% of the total caloric intake, with sodium less than 2,300 milligrams per day. It's pretty much the equivalent of about one teaspoon of salt. Um, there need to be a side note here, and um, whenever we'll educate our patients, we need to mention that most of the sodium that we are intaking um, in our daily diet will not going to come from the salt that we are adding to our cooked um, um, a meal. Uh, they are coming from the processed food. Um, from the chips, from everything that comes um, pre-processed in a bag. Um, also, we need to 
teach and explain what is what what is the notion of empty calories uh, so the empty calories are um, found in solid fats and all those added sugars that are added to the products that are processed and that we buy uh, from a, from a store because they do provide energy they do provide the amount of calories however they do not provide any type of nutrition um, it means that they are those kind of extras that um, you can eat um, but they will not gonna really uh, provide you a healthy uh, metabolism we'll discuss now how the alcohol uh, is seen from a diet point of view so when we are burning alcohol um, as a source of energy we'll yield about seven kilocalories per gram it's kind of high it's higher than the glucose uh, it's lower than the fat however the alcohol is not a nutrient because it's not producing anything useful to our uh, body is uh, what we are calling what we are talking before those kind of empty calories you do have the energy you do have the calories however there is no nutrition in it in general uh, an adult uh, organism can metabolize about half an ounce of pure alcohol uh, per hour um, and this the metabolism happens at the level of the liver um, if you want to uh, translate that in quantities it will be um about um a glass of wine or a can of beer uh, or a shot of a hard liquor and that's the amount that we can metabolize in one in uh, one hour the quicker we consume um the faster the alcohol will accumulate in in our bloodstream and as a result of that uh, there will be um, a change in the uh, metabolism of many cells um, alcohol has an ability to be absorbed very very quick from the stomach and also will continue to be absorbed uh, absorbed from the small intestine it is processed and metabolized by the liver however the liver is limited uh, by the ability per hour of metabolizing it as I said before it's only half an ounce of pure alcohol um, whenever the um, the delivery of the alcohol at the level of the liver will be at, at an excessive amount um, that may lead to an accumulation of fat in the liver tissue because it's again it's a source of energy and once the liver is processing it will transfer it transform it into uh, stored energy as fat uh, also it may lead to it can lead to inflammation and scarring of the liver tissue that eventually causes a condition that is called cirrhosis um, that uh, causes irreversible changes at the liver structure uh, and impairing the function of one of the most important organs in our body um, so just by knowing the um, high amount of calories that the alcohol is carrying you can understand why um, the alcoholism will be followed by or in the patients that are alcoholic you can see them some of them are um, obese um, on the other hand the the alcoholism may lead to malnutrition may lead to cancer uh, ulcers uh, and if it's consumed by women that are pregnant to fetal alcohol syndrome um, that's why the advice for the pregnant women is to not consume any type of alcohol during pregnancy um, at the level of the central nervous system it will cause an impaired judgment and um, may increase um, unexpected behaviors um, and as a result of that there are a lot of accidents including motor vehicle accidents or drowning and falls and uh, all kind of uh, injuries um, and in this kind of uh, category we can add uh, homicides and suicides um, you will have patients that will say okay but I'm consuming alcohol in moderation what is moderation means how do we measure that um, so it has been defined that uh, moderate alcohol consumption um, is that of uh, one drink per day for women and up to three, two drinks per day for men um, however um, there is some studies that we're studying and again those studies are going back and forth it's kind of a fashion thing more than anything else 
uh, some will say that there is a beneficial effect on the cardiovascular system, especially um, if the patients are consuming uh, one glass of wine per day. Which of the following will have the lowest glycemic index? A, glucose, B, sucrose, C, lactose, or D, starch? The answer is the lowest glycemic index is developed by a complex, uh, a polysaccharide, a complex um, compound, which is the starch. We discussed now some nutritional disorders um, and the Nutritional disorders may arise from either an excess uh, or um, or a deficiency in the necessary nutrients. Um, and along with that, we also have uh, what is called the weight control and extreme excess of calories, um, along with food allergies that are more and more prominent nowadays. Um, there are some foods. Um, that are considered allergens. And um, there are seen in, in the general population individuals with symptoms uh, one, once they are ingesting uh, certain types of foods as wheat or nuts, milk, shellfish, or eggs. Um, now, those can be uh, reactions to the actual food compound, uh, the type of protein usually that is present in all those um, foods food types that I was um, telling you, or the allergy can develop to what is called a food additive. It's something that was added to uh, a, um, a food uh, product that is uh, processed, and that can be um, added for flavor, uh, for coloring, or as a preservative because we want to prolong their shelf life. In terms of signs of, uh, of allergy, most of the time, the patients will present with skin um, um, elements, with skin allergies. They may have uh, involvement of the respiratory tract or they have involvement of um, gastrointestinal tract. In some extreme situations, the food allergy can become uh, fatal in the form of an anaphylactic shock for those that are extremely sensitive. Um, now, Back in the day, food allergies were really uncommon. They become uh, more and more common nowadays, especially to certain um, types of uh, food as um, peanuts. Um, and in the, in the range of peanuts, now there is uh, seen a cross uh, sensitivity to more and more nuts, even three nuts, um, starting from the peanut. There are some uh, non-allergic adverse food reactions. And most of the time, those will manifest themselves with this kind of gastrointestinal symptoms, like an upset stomach, like acid reflux or nausea or cramping. Um, in some cases, maybe a mild diarrhea. And this can be the result of um, some additives um, present or some toxins present in the, in the food or from uh, an en enzyme deficiency, like in uh, lactose intolerant patients. Malnutrition. Um, we define as malnutrition any condition when a vital nutrient is missing from the diet. Um, the common uh, malnutrition um, usually is not because the people do not have what to eat, but because they are eating too much one type of food and one type of food only. They do not have a diversified type of diet. There are some factors that are uh, commonly known uh, today as contributing to malnutrition, uh, and those will be poverty, um, old age, chronic illness, um, anorexia, a poor uh, dental health, um, and drug or alcohol addiction. Um, there is more common and uh, more um, has higher frequency in the poor in underdeveloped countries, um, especially. Um, and for those countries, we can see um, in, in types of deficiencies, we'll see vitamin A deficiency, iodine, or iron. Um, and you can see in, um, in those pictures, we have two types of protein deficiency. Um, we have what is called a, a marasmus um, that is used for what is called a severe protein energy malnutrition, especially in infancy and in uh, childhood. 
uh, for those in those cases, and you see the picture in your far uh, in your far left, um, the affected children will have very low weight, uh, muscle wasting, a wrinkled skin, uh, and you can just see the bones underneath. Uh, there is another condition that is uh, typically affecting toddlers, um, and it's called quashior core. And um, this happens in toddlers, toddlers once they are uh, weaned because another child that they were breastfeed. Um, and breastfeeding ensures pretty much the whole amount of, of um, covers well the diet of a child at that stage. Once they are weaned uh, because another child is born, um, they develop uh, malnutrition because of a lack of proteins. They will have some uh, calories, they will have energy coming from other sources, but they do not have enough proteins in di their diet. And as a result of a very low level of albumin in their blood plasma, the fluid will um, be retained in the tissues and they will develop a fluid accumulation in the abdomen in the form of ascites. And you can see this bulging stomach. Um, and they will have edema on the um, lower limbs uh, with um, discoloring a skin, the pigmentation, diarrhea, and muscle wasting. Uh, definitely, the malnutrition will increase the risk uh, for um, infections, uh, and that represents the primary cause of death before age five in uh, the developing world. Uh, you can, it's obviously to understand why their growth will be stunted. Um, they will, you will see this kind of wasting. It's, they have not, they do not have enough muscle, enough tissue on them. They have um, a reduced uh, mental capacity with apathy and irritability. Um, and also they have um, a low work or performing activity capacity. A very interesting question here will be now, what is the ideal weight? How, how and when do we need to control our weight? And in order to do that, we need first to understand what will be an ideal weight for an ideal individual. And how can we define that? In order to be able to define it, uh, we are using what is called a body mass index. And this will give you the measurement um, that evaluates the body size. Uh, it will be based on the ratio of weight to height and is calculated by dividing the weight in kilograms by the height in meters. Um, by now we know that the healthy range for this measurement will be anywhere between 18.5 to 24.9 in terms of um, BMI. However, this doesn't give you any information about the ratio, the amount between the muscle and the fat in that specific individual. Um, it also doesn't necessarily tell you enough just by seeing a number without really seeing the patient in front of you, you don't, uh, you cannot make any assumption regarding their health. And this because I will give an example. Let's consider someone that has uh, been training and is a bodybuilder, um, and usually they will have uh, a lot of lean body mass. However, the muscles have a higher density than the fat has. And as a result of that, someone that can be very healthy, in fact, have a higher BMI than expected. So always we need to put the BMI in the perspective of our patient and not just look at not some numbers or on a piece of paper. We need to put it always in the perspective of the individual. We'll define now based on the concept of BMI, we can define now what means to be overweight and what the obesity means. Uh, the overweight patient is defined as someone that has a BMI of 25 to 30, and an obese patient will be someone that has uh, a BMI over 30. Already said, normal will be up to uh, 24.9, 25 in our slide. So anything that is under 18.5 uh, uh, BMI will be considered an underweight um, patient. The causes for obesity are, are very complex and um, there are several factors that are involved and were studied uh, that can be, they can be social and economic, genetic and psychological. Um, and in a lot of cases, it can be even some metabolic factors associated. 
what we know for sure by now is the fact that um, being overweight, and um, it's even more uh, obvious for people that are obese, that will shorten their lifespan and will be associated with critical conditions that will affect the cardiovascular system, um, will contribute in development of the cancers and development of diabetes with all the complications that snowball out of um, diabetes. The um, obesity rate has increased over the past decades, um, especially um, in the American children. Um, and as a result of that, the incident of diabetes, uh, especially among children, has increased along with that. And that's one of the points where the uh, public health um, um, policies need to change in order to um, not necessarily prevent, but make sure that um, those percentages are not going even higher. What are some treatments? Well, um, Definitely diet and exercise by doing what is called um, lifestyle changes um, are important elements in treating obesity. Um, and um, when we recommend exercise, uh, we are recommending what is called high intensity intermittent exercise or the cardio type of exercise as opposed to those low intensity exercise as walking. That doesn't mean that we don't need to tailor the treatment the type of diet and the type of exercise to each of our patients based on their abilities. Um, for um, some of our patients, um, there is out there um, a wide range of weight loss drugs. However, their um, effect is inconsistent uh, and they have a lot of risk, metabolic risk associated with that. Um, the last uh, solution that we have for those type of patients will be uh, the bariatric surgery uh, for those uh, severe cases um, with a wide range of procedures in the last 20 years procedures started by being um, um, complex um, as the gastric bypass procedures going through the lab band procedures into uh, more simplified as the sleeve gastrectomy nowadays that are removing a part of the um, the stomach, leaving only a small pouch. And you see here some examples of the procedures, the um, the co complex procedures. We have two types of procedures. In fact, we have those that are um, restrictive procedures. We restrict the amount of food that the patient is able to um, 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 ingest, and those will be the lap band and the new, more modern um, in the last. 10 years of the gastric sleeve, that you can see how all the big pouch of the um, of the stomach is excised out, is removed, and the patient is left with that type of really tiny sleeve that that's all the stomach that the patient is left with as a, um, as a stack that can accumulate food. So we can see that they can eat, but only in very small amount. Another type of procedure um, that uh, was done back in the day, it's it's still performed in some places, is what is called is a malabsorptive type of procedure, and it's called the Roux and Y gastric bypass. And you can see that what is producing this type of procedure is compromising the amount of nutrients that are allowed to be absorbed. Um, you remember that we have about um, six meter, about 20 feet of small bowel that allow for the absorption of all the nutrients. And uh, the patients that are eating a lot, that are obese, they're eating a lot. So they are absorbing a lot. In this type of procedure, you can see that on the top of the picture, there is a staple line that will limit, will transform the big stomach into a tiny pouch that will be connected with the end of the bowel. Only the end of the loops will be attached to the, um, to the stomach. So only a short uh, part, usually about, um, a foot to, to two feet of the length of the uh, small bowel will be still exposed to nutrients. So those type of patients will not gonna, even if they are trying to eat, they are not absorbing, absorbing nutrients at the same um, intensity that they were doing before. Um, the underweight patient. Now an underweight patient will have a BMI that is under 18.5. And when you're looking to an underweight patient, you need to understand that in 
this um, compromised uh, metabolic case, they may fight and they may have problems gaining weight as much as someone that is overweight may have issues trying to lose weight. Um, there are um, a few categories of conditions that may lead to having a patient underweight. They may be eating disorders as anorexia nervosa and bulimia. Um, it may be a rapid growth, especially in um, teenagers uh, that will um, overcome, I mean, like will be overwhelming to the, 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 uh, rate, the growth rate will be so high that the child is not able to um, keep up by eating that much. Um, some allergies may result in underweight um, situations, uh, chronic illnesses, and also um, some psychological um, issues. Um, when we are looking to uh, anorexia, um, this can come from a variety of, of both um, uh, physical and mental disorders. Um, there will be, anorexia means an incapacity of eating. Um, when people are receiving chemotherapy, um, they may end up having as a side effect what is called anorexia. Um, there is a specific type of anorexia that is anorexia nervosa that is a psychological disorder um, that will be um, more frequent found um, diagnosed in young women. Um, they will be excessively thin um, and they will actually starve themselves um, and in many cases those patients may die um, because they do not want to eat. Uh, as a result of uh, being in a state of starvation, the body will break down body proteins to be able to generate the amino acids that are needed um, for maintaining the levels of energy to create glucose because they are not getting inside the body any type of, of calories, any type of energy. Um, all uh, body systems will be affected, uh, but at a certain point, the heart will be the one that will suffer the most, and that's pretty much the mechanism by which they may, um, they may die. Uh, a type of eating disorder is what is called bulimia. Um, it's a binge and purge type of syndrome. Um, those individuals will um, eat usually by binging uh, huge quantities of a certain type of food um, at, one, at once in, in one sip. And after that, they will induce to themselves uh, vomiting or they will use large doses of laxatives to uh, prevent the absorption of food and kind of purging themselves. Um, this obviously is a condition that will be associated with a lot of, of issues due to the fact that we'll have electrolyte in, uh, electrolytes imbalances as a result of the purging. Nutrition and aging. Um, there is more and more difficult the, um, during becoming older, it, it is more and more difficult to maintain a balanced um, diet. Uh, and there are a few elements that are contributing to that. Um, we discussed the sensory system, and I was telling you that the sense of smell and taste will decline. And as a result of that, if you remember, the appetite will decline because the patients will not going to be drawn, will not be attracted uh, to food. And as a result of that, they will um, eat, will consume less and less food. Um, and as a result of that, some nutritional deficiencies may develop along the way. Um, therefore, our um, elderly may need supplements, especially of the vitamin D, um, because vitamin D is also essential for the absorption of calcium, um, and um, they most of the time develop osteoporosis of, as a result of it. Several times we refer to the temperature homeostasis in our body and on how um, tight the, um, and how well defined is the uh, set point for this um, for this element for this uh, factor in our in our body uh, and regardless throughout the day we are going through uh, gaining heat and losing heat uh, constantly and uh, in um, various amount throughout the day however the body temperature is maintained uh, in this kind of narrow range very strictly and there are um, four types of heat loss um, mechanisms that we are uh, losing heat. Um, 
in addition to those four, and before we are starting to describe them, about a fifth of the heat, uh, we are losing it by respiration, because if you're filling the air that comes out of your nostrils, you can feel it that it's hot. So about a fifth of the heat is lost through the respiration. And in addition to that, um, is used through elimination of urine and feces. Um, it's also um, lost that way. The additional amount of heat loss will be obviously uh, through the skin. Um, and if you remember, in the dermis, we have the um, uh, capillaries, the blood vessels that are allowing us to lose or maintain, retain heat by vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So let's look into the, uh, the mechanisms of losing heat, first of all. So we can lose it by radiation. So the heat will travel from its source on the outside um, as waves or rays. Um, as an example of that, uh, it's just like the sun will radiate heat. Uh, we have a second mechanism, but, um, and that is the convection one. Um, the convection is losing heat through the movement of, um, of a cooling fluid, and that would be the air that comes around the skin and by um, the movement of this fluid around our body, we are um, losing um, losing the heat. We are cooling the skin. A third process with the process of evaporation, um, and the heat is lost by um, changing a liquid from a liquid state, a fluid from a liquid state to a vapor state, um, and that's the process that happens uh, when we are sweating uh, and. More than that, it happens even when you do not see the sweat as present through what is called the perspiration. There is a loss of fluids through our skin uh, throughout the day, even when it's not very obvious that sweat. And the fourth type of, um, the last type of um, mechanism of heat loss will be the conduction. Um, that a warm object will transfer its heat energy to another object that is cooler than, um, than the first one. Um, for example, uh, when we are touching uh, metal and the metal is, metals are conducting heat very efficiently and very quick, that's the best example that I can give you, um, that's uh, how we are losing heat. Um, in the picture, you see how the body is cooling the temperature by transferring the heat to a pack of ice. We'll discuss now how the body is producing, how the body is gaining um, heat. So it can do that um, from the environment, first of all. And it can do that by what is called the radiation from another object. It can be the sun um, or it can be a, a heating uh, body um, that is um, transferring this and radiates heat towards us. And we can gain heat from that. Or it can gain heat through the process of conduction uh, by coming in contact with a warm surface. Inside the body, that's from the outside. Now, what's going on inside the body? The metabolism with the high production of ATP, high production of energy, uh, happens at the level of the uh, mitochondria. Um, therefore, the heat production inside our body will be directly proportional will correlate in a, in a direct way with the tissue activity. The more activity a tissue has, the more heat it will be produced. Um, so in just by saying that, you understand that muscle cells activity uh, will produce uh, more when they are exercising. Or another example of heat producing by the muscles will be the mechanism of shivering. Um, food intake. While we are uh, metabolizing and uh, breaking down those uh, nutrients into uh, molecular particles, uh, there is an energy cost of processing and, and storing of those uh, nutrients. And the, um, the energy needed will be higher for proteins um, and will be consumed, more energy will be consumed while we are um, digesting uh, protein-rich meals um, as opposed to a fat-rich uh, meal where the um, necessary 
um, waste or expense of energy will be the lowest. The main center for regulating our temperature and uh, maintaining the homeostasis of it um, is at the level of the hypothalamus, um, just above the pituitary gland and kind of connected by its position with the endocrine system um, is the control center that will um, coordinate the maintaining um, the regulation of temperature through a negative feedback loop. Um, now let's look what's happening with a normal body temperature. Um, the normal body temperature um, is uh, defined as between 36.2 to 37.6 Celsius or 97 Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is the range of the variation of temperature uh, throughout the time of the day. Normally, our temperature is the lowest early in the morning because our muscles were relaxed and because we didn't eat anything. Um, so we were uh, fasting. So those two processes that are generating from the inside um, heat uh, are not used. On the other hand, the body temperature will become um, to be higher in the late afternoon or evenings because of the entire daily physical activity and the food that we, um, uh, we just ate. Also, the temperature, if it's measuring the different parts of the body, uh, will be will come up as having different values. When we are measuring it at the level of the axilla or in the armpit, that will be lower than if we are measuring it inside of a cavity, let's say in the mouth um, or in the rectum. Um, so we would like to be able to uh, have what is called to be able to measure what is called the core uh, temperatures. Uh, and that will be a temperature that will be measured inside uh, of the body as close as possible to the core. However, that's not, uh, that's not possible. What would be some responses? Now we have different responses to cold or to hot in order to manipulate and maintain our temperature uh, as a constant. Whenever the body temperature will fall below the set point, the hypothalamus will stimulate the blood vessels. And as a result of that, the vasoconstriction will happen to reduce the heat loss. Also, there will be impulses that will be sent to the muscles and the shivering process will start. And this is a, a rhythmic contraction in all this, the muscles in our body that will produce an increase of metabolic heat production. And in addition to that, we have what is called a behavioral uh, response, and that will be um, that of covering ourselves or um, dressing ourselves in uh, warmer extra clothing uh, or placing ourselves into a warmer environment. The um, opposite end will be the response to hot conditions. Um, and sometimes this can be a challenge uh, in terms of thermal regulation because um, there is a, a certain amount of heat that the body can disperse um, in, the, in the unit of time. Um, whenever the body temperature will increase above the set point that we defined before, um, there will be against uh, signals sent from the hypothalamus that will produce what is called a vasodilation at the level of the blood vessels in the skin. And by doing that, increasing the diameter of the capillaries will allow more blood to be exposed to the outside of the skin. And by doing that, will promote the heat loss. Uh, also, there will be a stimulation from the same center uh, in the hypothalamus, stimulation of the sweat glands to increase their activity and uh, to produce more sweat and uh, to increase the evaporation that uh, is promoting um, the sweating. Now there is a problem with the sweating and that is because the evaporation process in the efficiency of losing heat through sweating can be compromised if we are living uh, in high humidity surroundings. It will be very limited when the humidity exceeds um, at 60% in the air. So those uh, places that do not have the dry heat that we have here uh, in Fresno, um, let's say 
um, Florida, um, um, in the Florida uh, region, the, the um, uh, sweating process will be compromised because of the high humidity in those, um, in those places. There are some changes that are related to age in terms of temperature regulation. Uh, extreme ages, very young and very old, will have a limited ability to regulate body temperature. Um, so newborns and elderly will be at an increased risk to have an impaired body temperature uh, regulation whenever they are exposed to um, environmental extremes. Uh, a newborn's infant uh, temperature will decrease uh, whenever an infant is exposed to cold environment for a long period of time, um, as well as an infant, the elderly adults may not be able to uh, produce enough heat uh, to maintain the body temperature in a cool environment. The same way, the moment that we are exposed, both of them, both of those extreme ages uh, to um, a very hot environment, they will not be able to uh, reduce their body temperature efficiently and they may be um, uh, prone to develop um, um, any kind, a, a wide range of, of disorders. This uh, slide is summarizing um, the response to decreased body temperature and we'll start on, uh, on the left side with a green um, um, rectangle where it says that there is a decreased body temperature that will be sensed by the temperature receptors uh, that in consequence will send signals to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus center will send signals to the blood vessels for vasoconstrictions and to the muscles for shivering, those being the effectors. And as a result of that, the body temperature will increase. Slide that is, um, this slide is summarizing the response to increased body temperature. Again, we'll, we'll start in the uh, left side with the green rectangle. Whenever the body temperature is increased, will be perceived by the temperature re receptors in the skin with signals sent to the hypothalamus that in consequence will uh, command to the effectors that are the sweat glands to increase the sweat production and to the vessels to vasodilate to increase the loss of heat and to restore the body temperature to the set point. So fever. Fever is a condition in which the body temperature is higher than normal. So we call every patient or every individual that will have uh, a fever as being febrile. Now, fever is part if you remember from the previous chapter, it's part of the innate immune response to infection, to tumors, to vaccinations, and sometimes to um, outside contaminants. There are some substances that will be released from the immune cells, uh, and sometimes from the pathogens themselves. And those substances are called pyrogens. And as a result of pyro means fire, comes from the uh, word fire. Uh, they will trigger an increase in the body temperature. There are some non-immune causes for fever, and those will be uh, injury uh, or some conditions, some disorders of the central nervous system. Um, and in some cases, very rare cases, some um, individuals, uh, when they are under a lot of stress, they may uh, produce fever. There is a negative uh, feedback mechanism um, and that uh, will try to maintain and reset the, uh, the temperature to a new set point. And because of that, that's the explanation why every fever is actually preceded by a chill. Um, and when we look at the chill, uh, we'll, we observe a patient having the, the chill that's a violent shivering, uh, and the patient will complain of a sensation uh, they will feel very, very cold. And that despite of the amount of blankets that they may have or heating pads that they have around them. By resetting the temperature set point, uh, the body is trying to fight uh, any type of, of injury, usually a pathogen. So fever is actually beneficial um, because it will promote phagocytosis. 
um, at the level of the white blood cells will inhibit the uh, overgrowing uh, and multiplication of the pathogens and will also increase the metabolism and will produce vasodilation. Uh, so up to a point, the fever is, um, it's a good phenomenon and it's desired. So when we are looking at the at the fever after the the um, the increasing fever, uh, we have what is called the sudden drop. We have the um, when the fever ends and it um, returns to the normal temperature, that can be done in what in in two types of uh, mechanism. It can be done as a crisis, which is the sudden drop, and it's done by a profuse per perspiration. The patient will show up with a muscular relaxation and the, and the generalized vasodilation throughout the entire body, or the drop can be gradual and, and slow, and then it is called lysis. Uh, we can help um, to reduce the fever. We can help our patients by um, administering them what is called an antipyretic. In the normal individual, the um, heat regulating devices are very efficient. Um, however, there is a certain limit, and when that limit is reached, there will be some heat-associated disorders that may develop. Um, one of them will be the, what is called the hyperthermia, and that's an increase in body temperature above the set point, um, and it will signal um, a failure of the homeostasis. Um, in cases of hyperthermia, the body actually gains more heat um, than it can lose by sweating or vasodilation. And as a result of that, the heat will accumulate inside uh, the body. Um, it happens in uh, people that are performing uh, physical activities in hot and humid conditions. That can be athletes, uh, or it can be um, um, workers that are working on the outside. It can be farmers that are working in hot and humid uh, conditions. Um, more exposed and more sensitive to that will be elderly and children. Um, in terms of um, um, signs and symptoms uh, for that, um, a mild heat-related illness uh, will be seen uh, when the temperature will not, will increase but will generally not reach 40 degrees uh, with extreme um, uh, hyperthermia over that point. Um, usually, there but for, with the mild um, heat-related illnesses, the uh, cognitive functions will not going to be impaired. Uh, part of the um, signs and symptoms will be the heat cramps. Uh, they will complain of localized muscle cramping, especially at the extremities and sometimes at the level of the abdominal muscles. Uh, once they are um, exposed to a cool environment and they will rest, um, that um, heat cramp will disappear. Uh, we have another um, example and that will be what is called the heat exhaustion um, that represent the inability of an individual to maintain the physical activity in a hot environment due to, let's say, gastrointestinal issues as nausea or vomiting, uh, dizziness and weakness, and usually it will be associated with rapid heart rate. Um, the treatment for heat exhaustion will be rest uh, and uh, moving the individual to a cooler location with um, fluid replacement. An extreme uh, situation of uh, heat associated disorder will be the heat stroke, or also it's called the sunstroke, where the body temperature uh, will raise about above 41 Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. Um, the individual will show um, hot skin uh, that may be with or without sweating, because sometimes the mechanism of sweating may become compromised. Uh, the central nervous system uh, will show confusion, seizures, and uh, even loss of consciousness. Uh, what we need to do is to um, administer a rapid um, treatment in terms of body cooling um, and fluid replacement. Uh, most of the time, the fluid replacement will need to replace, in addition to just fluids, also the electrolytes uh, focusing on sodium, potassium, and chloride. Hyperthermia represents the state of an individual um, where and when the body is no more capable of coping with a prolonged exposure uh, to cold. 
um, as a result of that, in the individual will observe uh, uncontrolled shivering, a lack of coordination, decreased heart and respiratory rates uh, with central nervous system involvement in uh, uh, more extreme cases as slurs of speech, uh, sleepiness that may progress to coma and death. Um, what will increase the risk for hyperthermia will be any type of outdoor activities in a cool uh, or cold weather. Um, in cool weather, especially if the weather is um, associated with uh, wind or fatigue, uh, the um, energy um, reserves of the body will uh, be lost sooner. Um, as a result of the uh, extreme cooling of the body, the cellular metabolism will slow and also the heat production will um, decrease along with that. When we have a patient that was exposed to um, cold, especially the moist cold, um, as a result of that, we can observe a permanent uh, local tissue damage that is called a, a frostbite. Um, most common affected uh, sites will be the face, ears, usually the extremities. Um, and as a result of exposure to uh, cold, the extreme vasoconstriction will uh, lead to a reduction in the blood supply to that area that will lead to necrosis of tissue and um, gangrene. Um, what is very important to, to remember is that the frostbite, an area like that, uh, should not be rubbed. Uh, but what we do, we throw them by applying warm towels or um, by immersion of the um, um, of that limb of that part into a warm, not hot, warm water for 20 to 30 minutes. What is the term for a gradual decrease in fever? And the options are A, lysis, B, pyrogenesis, C, crisis, or D, anorexia. The term for gradual decrease in fever is lysis. 